Okay, hi, hi, welcome. Uh, my name is Sunway. Um, I'm with uh, with Arm, and I present today uh, how to get single boot image for uh, single board computers. And um, that's that's not an Arm limited story. I just happen to work for Arm, but do this on my spare time. Uh, so don't claim that Arm does something. Um, that is uh, totally independent. Um, yeah. So what we are talking about. So just briefly, how it is today. Why it is it bad? Uh, what we can do about it, and what works uh, in my lab conditions. Um, yeah, as I said, please don't blame this on ARM. Um, so what's this all about? It's about those called fruit pies. Um, basically, single board computers with ARM cores. We have a lot of them. Um, and they're all kind of separate, different, actually not. But if you look at them, or if you want to use them, they're all kind of special, and you, you need to do something special for each board. Um, it's all about servers. So if you get some decent boot story out of the box, then you're fine. Then you're settled. You install distributions from USB drives, and that's, that's everything's fine. Um, but chances are you're not if you're using SOCs. Hmm? Okay, um, if you're using SOCs from, um, from a winner, Rockchip, MLogic, or whoever, um, so, yeah, for, for those, this is kind of what, what we're talking about. Other SOCs are possible, it's just I don't have them um, at the moment. Um, yeah, it's also for storage-less boards. So what I'm talking about is that the idea of having a single SD card that boots several things. If you have um, a board that boots from SpyFlash already, then you're mostly done. Then um, you can have this there and then update via the distribution or whatever. Um, but many boards don't have or initially they don't have anything on SpyFlash, for instance, or they don't have a good story. Um, and also as a kind of disclaimer, when I'm talking about firmware, I'm talking about board-specific low-level firmware, including bootloader, and it stops there. So it's U-Boot, SPL, ATF, untrusted firmware. Um, it doesn't include any kind of kernels or distributions because on Android world, firmware is kind of everything. It, this is just f to get something booted. Um, and mainline, I don't have the time to deal with all this PSP stuff. Um, so what's the current situation? This is the Ambient uh, download page. That's from last year, so it looks fancier this year. Um, yeah, you have you, so this is one distribution, right? And you have tons of boards. Um, this is just 10% of it or something. And as you can see, keep in mind that you have orange by win, orange by zero, orange by R1, orange by prime. Um, so be careful with your, you just don't have an orange pie, right? So you have, you have to be careful which exact board you have. Um, the other way around is you go to the board vendor. This is from, I think, Rock64. Um, you go to the board vendor, and then you pick an image from there, which is, frankly, very dodgy. I'm not sure if um, this is kind of endorsed by Debian, for instance, the Debian image they provide. Just something hacked up with a BSP kernel, and you don't want to know. Um, so those two problems. So there are separate images for each board. Um, actually, they often contain very similar bits because like 99% of the thing is actually the whole user land, which is exactly the same everywhere. Um, even the kernel is the same today. Um, just the tiny firmware bits at the beginning that are different. Um, as I said, boards might be mistaken. Orange Pi is uh, special. They're very good in inventing <laughs> Uh, board names which only differ by one letter or something. So if orange pi 2 plus e or something, that's uh, it's very, yeah, so it's not, not trivial. Um, also problem, a different image. So if you choose the wrong image, it might work to some degree, but you have oh, kind of weird failures then. Um, I don't know, Ethernet doesn't work or whatever. Um, and it's then hard to troubleshoot. Um, also, the thing is that you don't have just not every board covered, and you don't care if just your board is not supported, then bad luck, right? Um, also, you have different qualities. So if you go to the vendor page, you have might have a good supplier for your images or not. Um, so it's all kind of problematic. Um, so the idea I had, why can't we actually try to get a single image? So one SD card, basically, that is able to boot all those boards. That sounds kind of, yeah, wacky. Um, the advantages would be it could be centrally maintained. It could be shipped by distributions. So if you have one image that covers everything, or a lot of things at least, 
um, then distributions wouldn't have to go like ambient that wouldn't have to provide all the kind of uh, different boards as separate download images or even more I mean ambient is kind of special thing but think of SUSE or Red Hat data wouldn't need to ship for every board and in fact they don't right so they um, they just provide a subset of boards that they explicitly support and it was also a relief to people to know beforehand which exact board they have and which one to download um, so what we need to do to get this working so first thing is we have one SD card to put it in we need to get something booted so we need to get our own code running that's the first step the second step is to detect the actual SOC that we are on um, and the third step is to detect um, the board um, once we are there we get basically into some common ground U-boot which can then load the rest of the firmware or at this point we know the board we can basically let's take a speak we can pick the actual component that we actually need and this is then going the standard mainline um, firmware support that we have and then we hand over to some UEFI bootloader kernel which is basically shared it's the same so you don't need different um, kernel for instance for each of those boards also grub for instance grub using EFI then it's the same grub image you don't need that separately okay so let's look at the first three things that is um, the interesting part so the boot process in the first step um, typical SOC boot processes they contain some embedded boot ROM um, which ultimate blob if you like but um, this is mass programmed in silicon so you can't change it by any means um, this is kind of burned into the thing um, so you can't update it but it seems to be good enough at least um, to, to get the job done um, and the good news is it typically can be read so you can basically um, yeah, just dump some kind of um, memory range and then you find typically that's assembly code yeah well some arm um, either 32 bit or 64 bit uh, stuff typical size is 32 to 64 kilobyte but it's the kind of thing which you can reasonably disassemble with some help um, and understand the mission of this boot ROM is basically to find the actual real boot source load some code and execute it um, and actually so many people say ah oh, it's a blob and wah but actually there's no way around to do this otherwise I mean you can't it's, it's not in the 80s anymore where you can take your flash ROM and hook it to the bus and then it accesses it and executes the code that is not feasible on an on a five dollar SOC which has a limited number of pins and the board is this size right so uh, you have to do something and then it basically goes over the different um, boot sources and, and finds the way um, then the code uh, finds is loaded into some SRAM SRAM because we at this point we don't have any DRAM enabled yet so it needs to find some SRAM that also means that the code is very limited and yeah the boot order so where it looks for the boot source that can be typically changed sometimes depends on the SOC and as I said the, the size is limited um, yeah so let's look at the different um, SOC families I would like to call them so for all winner SOCs for instance we know that it loads up to 32 kilobyte from sector 16 of the SD card it's like a magic burned into the boot ROM um, so there's some to, to for the boot ROM to accept it it has to be a magic magic number in there and to check some which has to fit um, and it doesn't find anything on a SD card it tries EMMC, non spy no flash and goes into USB OTG afterwards and as I recently found out it also tries not only sector 16 but also sector 256 which is very important for the next step and um, Rockchip SOCs similar thing only they load from sector 64 of SD card and they have of course different kind of whopping the things and also different is that they try EMMC non and spy no first and then only SD card um, and also they have alternative sectors which I just discovered this week actually um, oh a lot of them I, I knew about the first one but um, yeah there are other sectors um, MLogic SOCs got from Antonio two weeks ago so uh, it seems to load from sector one of SD card I have something um, booting there but it's, it's early stages 
I think we have a foot in the door there. It can be done. Raspberry Pi is easy because that one loads from a first FAT partition and it uses magic file names. So basically, that you can easily coexist with all the others because you can have a FAT partition starting quite late in the game, and then all you need is your, your magic um, thing. So this is kind of a um, graphical version of it. So this, the first thing is the generic SD card layout. You have an MBR, which could be kind of dummy MBR, and you have a GPT, typically the um, GOID partition table, up to 16K. And then the first megabyte is typically unused, and the first partition starts at one megabyte. That's how a typical partition tools layout is. For a winner, um, as I said, starts at 8K, um, <coughs> and Rockchip starts at uh, 32K, and I'm logic just behind it. Um, and then afterwards, they have, so that's the, the basic boot code, is those are those marked in red here. Um, and this basic boot code then loads the, the rest of the, the actual boot code after it has initialized DRAM, because it then has more space to actually loot the stuff. So the thing that you can actually see, it is not really to scale, but at least those, uh, those fit, that you actually, all those three overlap in, in one uh, region. So, um, yeah, so there are quite some clashes. And even more so, of course, for the, uh, for the other part, for the actual U-boot and ATF, that's uh, quite overlapping. Um, yeah, so the cool thing is that with those secondary boot locations, actually, you can work around this if you have enough space. Um, so you can use, yeah, secondary locations and then try to sort out a way where everything fits together. Um, what so my, my first plan was, if we can't do this, we can actually play some tricks. For instance, you make the, um, the old winner U-boot, uh, the, the SPL shorter, so that it stops at 32K. And then, um, yeah, try to load some other stuff first. So you can kind of, or you can carve out some stuff and, for instance, like jump over this one and then repeat this. Um, this fortunately not needed. Um, or you could, in general, have very small trampoline loaders so that they, they don't clash and then you actually load this. But it makes it all complicated. Unfortunately, the secondary boot locations kind of solve this quite neatly. So there doesn't need to be anything done. So we have some tiny changes in U-boot to accept those, um, but that's all. Um, and it assumes then um, that the location of the secondary images can be freely chosen, which is true if we control the first part which is true if, we, if that is U-boot SPL, because there's just one variable which actually says from which sector to load. And conveniently, just behind the SPL, because why would you leave a gap? But if you need to combine several, you can actually arrange them and then just put the, um, the right values in each SPL. So that doesn't load just behind it, but from one megabyte or two megabytes or whatever. OK, so that's the first part. So you have your own code now booted. Uh, the second part is, that um, you m want to support multiple SOCs, right? So it's not just one SOC from each of the families, but multiple SOCs. Um, to detect this is actually not that hard. Um, it's just not really, Ubud is not really good at this because Ubud is like forever has been compiled for a single board. So when you configure Ubud, um, you select basically one board. It's not you select you don't select a SOC or you don't select a family, you select one particular board, and then it compiles something for exactly that board. If you look closer at these modern platform ports, they actually configure the, the whole thing for one SOC, and then maybe select a bunch of drivers, and then select the right DTB, so the, the device tree for this. So actually, there isn't much difference in there, um, because you could say, okay, I use a superset of drivers, which covers every board, um, yeah, but you still have this one SOC problem. Um, and it gets a bit harder because stuff that is quite flexible in the actual U-boot part is not so flexible in the SPL um, because many things get um, hard-coded there. So the solution is there, basically. You have a lot of if defs, which is kind of, so if you want to see a project with a lot of if defs, check U-boot code, it's awesome. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just, um, so the idea is to, yeah, Easy said, we just convert if devs into runtime decisions. Um, and then we detect, we detect the SOC and what was if devs before, then come ifs, basically. Um, 
Detecting SOC, you use platform specific MMO registers, um, infuses, or use heuristics. One of my favorite is um, the gig. The gig has an ID register in the end, which is not trivial, so it's not one or zero or something, which is actually very, it's a number of um, bytes that are very special, basically. And if you can probe this, so if you know that it's, sh that it's safe to read those locations, then you can actually see if that is basically the gig signature. And then you can match this with, an, with um, your known gig signature. So if you know that at this, uh, this SOC has the gig at this point, this point in memory, you can actually verify that it's the SOC that you think. So we use this for, um, for the H6 for your winner, which is a bit special. How close are we to the size limit if you want to? Yeah, that's a good thing. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> um, but there are ways around this. Um, so we can. Um, use two chain garbage collection, um, even with those. I will show you. In a minute. So that what it looks today, the if def thing, right? <coughs> so you you start with that's a long chain actually, so that goes for two pages or something. So you say if define config map sum five i, then um, yeah, set those pins in this way. You see that <coughs> port B nineteen and the other is it's H twenty and whatever. Um, and the idea is that you can convert this into something like this, where you basically call a function, you get the SOC ID, and then you assign this. Um, yeah. So that's from a patch I have. Um, so that um, is not, yeah, so that, that works. I did this for all winner, so I can basically have all those stuff that works for all of winner SOCs. Um, and then it would need to be done for, for more SOCs. Um, or for more families. Another thing is DRAM initialization, which is typically even board specific. Um, and this is also where you, if you configure for a particular board, you sometimes get a specific DRAM parameters um, hard configured for the board. Um, what you could do is you try to probe stuff. And also what happens anyway, mostly is you go with one size fits all parameters for DRAM. For instance, for on your winner side, we actually suppose everything is kind of DRAM uh, 1333, um, so DDR 1333, um, and then use some yeah, magic values, um, which we have from, from all winner, which is kind of safe across all boards. So technically, it's not. And you could actually run the DRAM much faster if you know exactly how long the um, delay lines, so how long the lines are and how much delay you would have to insert. But we don't do this anyway today. And even if we would do, we could kind of work out some fail-safe values, which at least work on everything. You might not get the full performance. But for the use cases, that might be good enough. Um, also, what um, if you have different DRAM types, so LPDDR3, for instance, and DDR3, which is common on all winner, kind of half the boards have DDR3, the other half have LPDDR3. Um, and this, the, uh, even though they kind of look similar, they're actually quite different in terms of how do you need to program the DRAM controller. Um, and there's not many ways to detect this beforehand, but what I figured, if I used accidentally the wrong image, it always reported zero megabytes because at some point it went wrong. And I thought, well, <laughs> why not use this? And basically, if, if I get zero megabytes, but it doesn't make any sense, then I just try the other one. And that required some... Yeah, easy set. Two weeks later, I've refactored the whole DRAM driver. And that actually now works, so I can um, yeah, try the other one. And that means it boots on whatever the board has LPDDR or DDR. <coughs> All right. Um, the third thing is detecting boards. So that's a bit tricky. Actually, re reliably detecting a board is impossible. So that <laughs> just imagine that the board that comes out tomorrow will never be covered. Right, with your image today, but people might ex expect it. Um, also, it's dangerous, so you can't just um, try to set the voltage to something, and if they have the PMIC configured differently, then you apply 3 volt to something which is 1.8, um, which doesn't sound very healthy. Um, it can be achieved for a subset of boards where it gets very, very interesting. Um, so, for instance, I have the subset of boards that are on my desk, basically. I can have kind of heuristics how to detect which board it is. Um, so I could look at the DRAM size and the DRAM type. So if you have a two gigabyte LPDDR, it must be the Pine64 LTS, for instance. 
if you have a two gigabyte DDR3, then it must be the old Pine64, which has DDR run. And so if you can confine yourself to a subset of boards, which becomes interesting for board vendors, um, you can actually achieve something like auto detection. But it would be then limited to this thing. But it might be good enough. So for instance, I think I've figured out a way to detect all stuff that Pine64 offers, uh, including detecting the Pine book from the Pine64 LTS. So, um, yeah. But this is not really reliable. Um, and it's also not scaling, of course. There will be in one point you can't tell two ports apart. Um, so the solution is, I think, to present a list and let the user choose. And that list should be ideally shortened already by the stuff that you know. So if you have detected two gigabytes of DRAM, you, can, you don't need to show all the boards that have only one gigabyte. Um, yeah. And then this list basically selects the, the actual device tree file, because that's mostly the, the actual board difference that we have today, um, apart from the DRAM parameters, is the device tree, which tells the, how, how the stuff is connected on a board. Um, the cool thing is that this is basically already mostly done, because we use fit images typically for those boards, and they can hold multiple DTBs. And they have a board-specific function which lets you choose one of the DTBs according to some hard-coded stuff. So the moment we just use this, for instance, for, for Pine64, we have a one board which is very similar, only differs by the DRAM. And we, by looking at the DRAM, we already decide which, which DTB to choose. So we could just extend this and just need to present some kind of menu, whatever. Yeah. All right, so the status. I have some Hello World image with some bare metal code, um, which um, shows, yeah, dumps some information about the CPU. So it basically does the basic initialization, gets the UART running and prints out something. Um, this is pretty short, and um, yeah, I don't need anything fancy and upstream for this. So I can, I have one image which basically works on all of the SOCs, including 32-bit ones even, works on Rockchip. 32, 28, and 3399. And it works on Antonio's Android C2 that he lent me. Um, so this is kind of the proof of thing that it actually, this thing works. Um, you would and beyond is much more trickier because for the, for the stuff I just uh, said. So it works, I have a single image which boots um, boards with Orbiner A64 and H5. Um, <coughs> Other SOCs are not supported because, I will tell in a minute why, um, and um, that works with the Firefly 3399 because that is supported in mainline U-boot, and I can basically play all tricks with loading it later on and move, this, move the SPL around. For the Rock 64 there's no mainline support and no mainline U-boot support, unfortunately, so I have to go with the existing BSP version. Um, the good thing is because the rest is so flexible, you can basically start with the inflexible one and then see how the others fit in. And you can yeah, basically get away with this. Um, yeah, so the open issues. Um, the SPL needs to know the load address at link time, which is an issue for um, if you have different load addresses for different SOCs. So um, for the Orbiner H6 ones, we have a different SRAM load address than for the other parts. Um, so the U-boot code out of, out of the box doesn't work. And the solution is to make this position independent, which um, is not too hard, but given how many tricks we already play with SPL to make things going, it sounds like tricky to achieve. Uh, I haven't tried. Um, if you don't have mainline, so mainline SPL support, as I said, it gets much harder because you have less degrees of freedom how to hack things around. Um, that's for the 3328. It's a Shiva. I found some patches. I couldn't make them compile, for instance, on mainline U-boot, uh, or even on the, the branch didn't compile. Um, so it needs to be cleaned up and upstreamed, and then you can do this. And at the moment, there's no SPL support for M-Logic SOCs, as I thought I could find. Um, I could get my own code running, but that started in EL1, which doesn't sound too good. Um, yeah, that makes coexistence much more complicated. As I said, it can be tolerated for one SOC. So if, if MLogic is the only one, or if, if there's one special SOC, you can start with that. 
and then build the others around it. Yeah, so the conclusion is um, there's one image which can boot multiple boards. Um, I have some proof of concept. It's unfortunately I didn't have the time to set up the things. I mean, you can imagine it takes some time to set up one board, but four <laughs> boards, and with all the different cables. And, um, but you can ask me, and I can show you outside maybe. Um, but there's a lot of integration work uh, left, especially upstreaming might get interesting. So if you tell the U-boot maintainers that you want to make the SPL position independent and you want to support multiple SOCs, that um, yeah, might take a while. I mean, it's not it's not what U-boot is today, right? Um, use cases, um, distribution installers sound quite tempting to support a range of boards with one installer. Um, firmware flashes, so you can basically put, you don't put real kernels maybe on it, but just have something in U-boot where you have the actual firmware, you support one image, the user puts it in, selects a board, and that flashes it to either EMMC or the spy flash. So then you take the SD card out and boot with the same environment. Um, Multi-distribution installers, something like the Raspberry Pi is this noobs thing where you basically boot into some menu and you can actually have this quite easily with Grub. You can have a Grub where you have all the, um, the kernels for, for, uh, for Red Hat, for SUSE, for Debian, for Ubuntu, and the installer in it are these under different menu items and then you have one thing which boots and you can actually choose to install the rest over the network. And of course your own bare metal application, if you like. You can support multiple boards. Yeah, that's it. Um, as I said, sorry for the demos not happening, but questions? Sorry.